I'm Michael Aaron of NJN News. It's Tuesday morning, April the 4th, 2006. We're doing a series of interviews on the Brendan Byrne years in New Jersey. I'm about to talk to Alan Handler, retired state Supreme Court Justice and a counsel to the governor during the 70s. Alan, uh, pretend I know nothing about New Jersey and tell me who Brendan Byrne is and was. Brendan Byrne, uh, I think uh, foremost, uh, at least in the minds of uh, uh, New Jerseyans, uh, was a, a distinctive and distinguished uh, governor. Uh, he, uh, in his uh, terms in office, I think set a, uh, a tone for um, uh, setting uh, the right goals, uh, pursuing them with a, a consistency and, and a strength that um, was uh, unusual, and that uh, he, uh, he left a legacy uh, from his uh, tenure in governor in terms of, uh, in terms of accomplishments. Uh, in my lifelong exposure uh, with, with Brendan, I would have to say that his, his commitment to what he thought was right and in the public interest was, uh, was the most uh, enduring and unswerving aspect of his, uh, you know, of his personality. And uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, the legacy that, that he left and the benchmarks that he reached, um, I think have served as, you know, as examples uh, in, the, uh, in, in the years uh, succeeding. On, on a personal level, uh, he uh, uh, enjoyed friendships. Uh, he was loyal to friends. Uh, again, his abiding sense of the right would not deter him if he felt that even even a close friend had done something wrong. Uh, but um, in the overall, he's just uh, because of these qualities. He's I think he has made a stamp as a, a very unique and distinctive individual in, in New Jersey. You don't think other governors have been goal oriented and and uh, seen what they wanted to do and worked hard to accomplish it. I I think uh, uh, our, our governors, you know, for the most part. Uh, have uh, have had their agendas and have had uh, 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 goals that they uh, have sought to accomplish and, and have accomplished. Uh, in in Brendan, perhaps because of my uh, proximity to him and the closeness uh, of our relationship, uh, I've been uh, impressed uh, to an extent that I haven't had the opportunity uh, with others to see what was entailed in these in these challenges and the and the strength and consistency with which he with he met these challenges. Listening to you talk about him uh, and how uh, consistent he was in pursuing what he thought was right, uh, one can take away from the description uh, either the idea of someone who is stubborn and pig-headed or visionary. Um, do either of those words apply? Uh, I uh, I think it would probably be closest to uh, to visionary. Uh, some of his uh, goals and ideals uh, were uh, were difficult uh, to attain. Uh, they uh, were not uh, universally uh, popular. Uh, in many respects, uh, difficult to uh, to explain and to sell uh, to the legislature and and to the and to the people, uh, and uh, he had an abiding sense of what he believed was uh, in the in the welfare of uh, of the state with respect to so many of these uh, enterprises that. 
uh, they've made a, an indelible impression on, on me. I sense you talking about the income tax when you're making some of these statements. Did he come into office wanting to uh, institute an income tax in New Jersey? Well, I never had that sense. Of course, when he came into office, uh, I, um, I was a spectator, a bystander. I was a, uh, on the Superior Court and uh, basically would be um, following the news and keeping abreast of events uh, in Trenton as, as any other um, uh, citizen. What county were you a judge in? Uh, well, when I was appointed, I uh, sat first in in Essex County uh, on the on the trial bench for about five years, and then I uh, was elevated to the appellate appellate division. And I had known uh, Brendan over the years, um, uh, uh, somewhat, uh, not too closely, uh, even in earlier days when I was with the Attorney General and uh, uh, he was a prosecutor in, uh, in Essex County, he became, uh, I believe, chairman of the Utilities, Public Utilities Commission uh, and, and the like. And what did you do for the Attorney General? Oh, well, I had become the first Assistant Attorney General under, uh, uh, initially under uh, Dave Furman and then Arthur Sills and that was during the administration of, uh, of Dick Hughes. So you, you knew Byrne. Uh, you were a judge in Essex County. He was the prosecutor when you were a judge? Uh, no, no. He was the prosecutor before I, I became a judge. But our paths crossed. Uh, we would play squash at every opportunity from time to time. Uh, and, Who won? Uh, um, I'll let him uh, answer, answer that. <laughs> <laughs> answer that question. Uh, well, continue the story of how you and Brendan Byrne came to work in the State House together. Well, it's uh, it, it's a story that uh, hardly has a uh, has a theme or a plot because uh, our earlier days, uh, as I said, didn't. Uh, have uh, a lot of close contacts. Our paths did not uh, cross often. Uh, when I was in the Attorney General's office, uh, I did a, a fair amount of um, work for the Division of Taxation, and among those responsibilities was uh, re the representation of county boards of taxation, which, despite its name, they're really state agencies. and. Um, memory serves, I think Brendan's father uh, sat on the Essex County Board of, Board of Taxation. And I think uh, uh, in arguing cases before the uh, County Board of Taxation, uh, or it might have been the Division of Tax Appeals, uh, I'm, I'm not totally clear on that now, but um, I think anecdotes would, would get exchanged. Uh, in terms of those experiences and, uh, and, and Brendan. But how did you come to be his counsel and when? Uh, it was uh, something that was totally fortuitous. I, um, I had no, uh, my furthest imaginings, the, the remotest idea that I would uh, eventuate as a counsel, counsel to the governor like anyone else. I uh, followed uh, the history of his administration uh, with a great deal of interest and, and curiosity and I, I shared with so many others um, what appeared to be uh, his growing political misfortunes and malaise towards the end of his uh, first administration, um, uh, being a a good friend and and loyal supporter, I would uh, read and wince, uh, you know, hearing uh, the repeat of you know one term burn and uh, things th things of that uh, things of that nature. I. Uh, 
never assumed, though, that in in any way this was uh, an interest, uh, an immediate interest of mine, or anything that would be more than just uh, a concern that any uh, any citizen might might have. But towards the end of his uh, first administration, uh, I got a call uh, with the surprising request, would I consider becoming his counsel? Uh, to me, the idea was almost outlandish. I was uh, ensconced, as it were, as a superior court judge. I think by this time I had been on the bench eight years. You were superior or you were in the appellate division at that point? Yeah, the appellate division, uh, you know, of the superior court. And, and uh, Chambers were where? Uh, I think my uh, my chambers moved. I, I I I think I started out in Newark, at the Mutual Benefit Life Building, uh, where uh, members of the court had chambers. Uh, the Supreme Court, uh, Chief Justice Weintraub and Jacobs and Francis, and some appellate division judges had chambers there as well. And then um, some year or two later. Uh, my chambers were uh, moved to Somerset. I took over the chambers of uh, Fred Hall. How old were you at the time? Well, I think I was then uh, 44. Who called you? I got a call from a mutual friend, uh, a person who um, uh, was uh, very, very loyal to Brendan, knew Brendan, supported him uh, uh, in, in every way he could, uh, Senator Greenberg. And, uh, of Essex County? Of Essex County. Marty Greenberg. Marty Greenberg, and, and Marty was a very good friend of mine as well. We had known each other ov over the years. And um, he told me he was calling uh, at Brendan's behest and uh, was wondering whether I would consider becoming counsel. And uh, I said, uh, this is a uh, really a rhetorical question because I, I know the answer. You wouldn't be asking me unless Brendan really wanted this to happen. He says, you know, of course. Uh, he says he, he very much uh, is enthused about the prospect, and I said, "Well, I, I, uh, I'm confounded by it because I basically have no ambition other than continuing as, as a judge." I said, "I enjoy it. I think it's where I belong and what I want to do, and uh, I'm really content to follow this out as, as, as my career. I wouldn't have opted to go on the court unless I were prepared to make that commitment." And um, Senator Greenberg said um, both facetiously and astutely, uh, well, maybe you could uh, con consider this as a, um, as, a, as, a, as a sabbatical. Uh, I said, in what sense? He said, well, uh, it may not be in the cards that Brendan is going to be reelected, but in any event, uh, there's every reason to believe that if you wanted to be reappointed to the court, that that would be a fair prospect. Um, I said, well, I can't gauge the you know political likelihood of you know of that of that sort of thing happening. Uh, Do you recall how much before the election this discussion took place? Well, this, this would have been in the late spring of 76, so that's almost a year before. Before the election. Before the election okay. cycle, so the list. So. Um, and why was Byrne needing a new counsel? Well, he, his counsel, uh, who was Lou Caden, apparently uh, had opted to resign. Uh, and uh, uh, Lou Caden had been his counsel, I think, for the first three years, and uh, 
I knew him to be an extraordinarily able and, and effective and uh, you know an individual and I don't know what the circumstances were that uh, were prompting uh, Lou to resign at that at that point so um, I uh, I gulped hard and and agreed I thought it would be a extraordinary change of pace I thought it would be terrifically invigorating and, and stimulating and I also felt that uh, it would give me an opportunity to really uh, work with Brendan and do whatever I could in my capacity as counsel to uh, help him in his uh, in his administration and I have to confess that when I agreed to do it and came down to familiarize myself with my new office and so forth and so on I encountered Bill Kirshner uh, in the uh, halls of the uh, State House and uh, he said to me with his hands palms out why tell me why <laughs> who was Bill Kirshner uh, I uh, I don't know whether Bill was, um, I, I may be underestimating his role. I can't quite remember whether he was chief of staff or some, some um, he had some major, major position in the, um, in the administration. And uh, uh, in fact, I think his words of greeting were, hello, dummy. <laughs> And, well, and and then I then I encountered Dick Leone, who was then I think the treasurer, and uh, he was the one that said, "Do you know something that <laughs> that we don't know?" How difficult was it to, to come in at that time and adjust to the council's job? Uh, it, it it was uh, I I found a little bit. Um, awkward and uh, unfamiliar. I was uh, very unpracticed in terms of the kind of administration that uh, the position would entail. Uh, I had to familiarize myself with staff. I had to get on top of different uh, issues and problems, the agenda, the basic way of handling things in, in council's office. Uh, there was a period of adjustment and it went pretty quickly. You used the phrase that you expected a change of pace and you expected something uh, invigorating and stimulating. Did you get that? Uh, yes. Uh, the, uh, the difference between judicial work and executive work is uh, is like like night and day. What is the difference? Well, uh, with judicial work, uh, you uh, it's it's structured. It's very deliberative. Uh, you're handling issues which have been um, very managed and clarified, uh, presented in a, uh, in a with a uh, accepted format for purposes of, of decision. Uh, you can render your decisions uh, uh, without any pressure aside from the challenge of the difficulty of the, you know, of the case, of the case itself. It's, it's, it's intense work, but it's not, it's not hectic. And uh, in a, to a great extent, it's very manageable and it's, um, and it's and it's somewhat predictable. Uh, working with the governor uh, in the executive branch uh, was uh, the total the total opposite. Uh, problems would arise unexpectedly, quickly. Uh, they were both problems of substance, problems of personality. Uh, problems of you know politics uh, 
and um, uh, so the the entire working environment was was very very different. What does the council do? Uh, the the council uh, uh, basically uh, responds to the governor and the governor's immediate office in terms of issues that require uh, uh, real or imagined, but require uh, the advice or the input uh, of, uh, of a lawyer, uh, of a person who uh, would understand, you know, the, the legal uh, ramifications of, of problems as what, well. What percentage of that means reviewing legislation and what percentage falls into other areas? Reviewing legislation is a constant uh, part of council's responsibility, and that very much turns on the on the legislative flow. All legislation is reviewed, it's analyzed, uh, it's summarized, uh, pros and cons, uh, other implications that that appear from that review are are, are expressed and, and, and shared, uh, you know, within council's office by council and, and with the governor and, and the governor's uh, and the governor's staff, his policy people, his chief of staff, and you know the governor himself, and that constitutes a very uh, uh, significant part of uh, of the work of council's office. Aside from that, or overlaying that, are are the um, many unpredictable questions that will come up, uh, you know, in the course of a day or, or Such a, as. Uh, a week? Uh, well, uh, problems with uh, uh, handling uh, legislation uh, that's in progress, uh, uh, issues involving. Uh, not only legislators, but other uh, uh, persons in government, be it county, municipal, uh, where uh, the administration is uh, seeking to achieve something or deal with something and others have interests uh, in it and, and the issue is crystallized in some way uh, that it comes to the governor's attention or the governor uh, wants it uh, 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 reviewed or handled by uh, by council's office uh, issues with um, independent authorities uh, and and things of that nature, which really are, are very hard to you know predict and very hard to uh, capitalize. Do you become an advisor to the governor in the process? Uh, uh, very, you know, very much so. Uh, the, the governor, uh, uh, ca the council, basically counsels the governor. Uh, will advise the governor. Will give the governor the benefit of uh, of, uh, of reactions uh, and uh, help help the governor evaluate uh, the ultimate decision. Of course, is will always be the governor's. Do you? Uh Suggest to the governor that he file a lawsuit. Does the governor file suits? Uh, does the council get involved in that, or is that a, a, a minor aspect? Of no, the no. That uh, well, those things don't happen often, but they but they they do occur, and uh, uh, it, in most respects, uh, uh, litigation uh, by the state uh, would be handled by the attorney general, but. Uh, it would be rare uh, in which the attorney general would would be uh, uh, pursuing uh, a a piece of litigation that touches the administration, as it were, uh, as opposed to something that would be uh, more uh, expected, more routine, like involving administrative agencies and. Uh, issues before administrative agencies, but uh, anything that really uh, 
touches the administration of great importance where it may be controversial or there may be some differences of opinion as to the necessity or wisdom you know of a, of a lawsuit or other types of legal action uh, uh, that would uh, almost invariably be shared with the council. Do you remember what a typical day was like as council? Uh, a typical day was one that couldn't be planned. Uh, there would be no such thing as um, a believing that you could commit to be home for dinner and and keep that commitment. Uh, the um, the remarkable thing about the office, I would say, would were its exigencies. Uh, the the just simply the the inability to um, uh, really. Uh, control <laughs> the docket as it were uh, the issues that would be uh, crossing your uh, crossing your desk uh, uh, the um, the difficulty of maintaining a um, a structured uh, a structured schedule uh, it's not as though uh, there wasn't a day without emergencies or things that were coming up that weren't anticipated or couldn't be anticipated, but so frequently that was that was part of the part of the routine. Who were the key legislative personalities of your time in the state house? Uh, names escape me really. Um, Merlino, Joe Merlino of Trenton. Joe Joe Merlino. Uh, I guess uh, he was Senate president for a time. Yes, and I think while, while I was there, he was. Um, uh, I think uh, there were some uh, uh, Republican uh, uh, heavyweights. I guess it was Sandman. I guess it was Charles Sandman, Sandman of Cape May. Cape May was. Uh, certainly to be reckoned with and uh, he ran for governor in the primary in 73 same year that Byrne won the Democratic primary. I think that's right yeah right. yeah um, uh, in the house I guess Billy Musto uh, who Alan Karcher. oh yes yeah Alan Karcher, I guess he was there then. Alan well. Karcher of Middlesex yeah, County, yeah. Billy Musto of Hudson County. Hudson County, yeah. Um, were you comfortable dealing with these guys? Uh, not entirely. Uh, I, uh, it, it wasn't, um, it, it had been, you know, quite a few years, if ever, I had been a hell fellow well met. And, um, but uh, it, it, it never really was a, was a problem. I, uh, I would wrap myself in the, in, the prob in the issues that I had, that I had to deal with and uh, always felt comfortable doing that. What were the big issues of your time as counsel? Well, the, uh, I, I think the most notable and and most notorious, of course, was, was the school funding uh, litigation, uh, which was very critical, very paramount, uh, both divisive and, and galvanizing. It was uh, it was a momentous a momentous issue, and at the time, um, uh, it was very much coming to. Um, a head, and when I say a head, it was an issue that over the years would have many heads. <laughs> but at, 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 at this time, uh, uh, the the confrontations I think were were sharper and were deeper. Uh, the um, uh, series of court cases uh, was making it less tenable uh, on the part of those who were resisting the implications of the first Robinson case. Which were what? Well, that 
in some meaningful way, uh, educational opportunities had to be enhanced in the state's poorest uh, school districts, that they had to be improved. And in, in the first Robinson <coughs> cases, uh, the court, I think very astutely said, this is not a matter of equal protection as such, that uh, school districts throughout the state aren't entitled to the same level of education, but that they are entitled to an education that is thorough and efficient, which means that it has to be an adequate education. It has to be an education that's going to give students uh, an opportunity to succeed in life and compete in life. Uh, so it, it was a broad standard that implied that something had to be done on a concrete basis to improve and advance and enhance education in, in the lower schools and quite clearly it was going to be costly and it would entail a you know a major shift in resources in the state in one one fashion uh, one fashion or another and uh, the resistance came from from those that uh, uh, basically uh, were uh, inured, you know, to the status quo, uh, who uh, Who were, would those people be? Well, uh, they, they were uh, uh, certainly uh, representatives of uh, wealthier school districts, uh, even mid-range uh, mid school districts, who uh, uh, were very much dependent upon uh, their current means of financing uh, public education, which was essentially through the through the property tax and a certain amount of uh, of state aid and the like, and uh, I think the resistance was born not so much from any resentment or feeling that um, something didn't have to be done for the poor school districts, but from the fact that they didn't want to detract from their own uh, uh, educational uh, regimens. So how did the state income tax fit into this fight? Well, I, I, I think that when it was perceived that ultimately there would have to be a legislative as well as an administrative solution to these problems, uh, the the difficulty was to um, find a lever to generate that kind of action on the part of the legislature and uh, uh, administrators. A funding source needed to be found. The, pr primarily, it would be it would be a funding source. And I there mean, was no state income tax in New the, Jersey the, at the, the time. There was, there was no no state income tax. No no broad base of. Uh, a broad revenue source. There was a sales tax. There was a sales tax, yeah. What, do you recall what it was in those days? Uh, <laughs> I, as a matter of fact, I, I, I don't. Three percent? Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah. I, I don't uh, know. Yeah. Okay. Um, but but it, it it appeared that um, you know that that an income tax would ha would have to be uh, uh, devised. Um. In retrospect, how critical was the Supreme Court's order in getting the income tax and school reform enacted? The, um, Would, wouldn't it have happened eventually? It's, it's, it's hard to say, only because my own sense was that the resistance was, uh, was very, very strong. Um, uh, it, it was uh, abetted by, you know, a perception that maybe the court uh, had um, misread the Constitution, overreached and so forth. If you go back to the history of the thorough and efficient clause, which I had done, uh, you, you come to learn that it was originally conceived of as a rudimentary education and, uh, uh, and, and somewhere in its evolution it became a thorough and efficient education and uh, that had never been carefully um, Analyzed or defined until the Robinson cases, and and so uh, th there there may have been a feeling on the part of um, 
some that the court had uh, misread the Constitution or that its own interpretation was not the inevitable one. But I think the, the problem basically was an institutional and, and political one where uh, uh, with our strong traditions of, um, of home rule, uh, the notion is that you know we take care of our own, we, we make sure that our systems work and are effective. And if uh, other school districts can't can um, can't cut it, so to speak, that's that's really their problem, not our problem. Would it have been better for the court to stay out of the issue and let the legislature act? Uh, I I don't think so. I mean, I I believe that the result is a sound result. I think it's a constitutional result. I think it's uh, a result that comports with with good government in, in the in you know in, in the public welfare uh, I think the 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 result you know has been vindicated not only in our own state but even nationally um, uh, not very long ago uh, anticipating the anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education the New York Times had uh, uh, stated in its in its editorials that uh, uh, the second most important uh, school case was our New Jersey case of Abbott versus Burke, which came some years some years later. But it's the sequel of of all of these uh, pieces of litigation and the and the stance that uh, that the governor had taken and the and the courts had taken. Uh, you say that you were uh, approached about becoming counsel in the spring of 1976. Was it the summer of 1976 when the court uh, ordered the school shut unless and until the other branches of government addressed this problem? It, it, it was. As a matter of fact, I uh, th think I joined the governor's office just uh, when that case was ready to be presented. To the Supreme so what was Court. it like in the governor's office when the Supreme Court said, let's shut the schools? Uh, I think everybody swallowed hard. Uh, the, I, I think it was... It was July. There was no school. So it, it didn't really matter. It was a hollow threat. What? It, well, it, 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 it wasn't hollow. It was, um, it was like, uh, you know, the drumbeat from across the river, you know, <laughs> threatening... <laughs> Uh, you know the act. We won't. We won't allow school to open in September unless you do something before yeah, September. Yeah. yeah, I I think in 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 many ways it was um, uh, it, it was. I, I don't know that it was a tactical move at all. I don't recall that, but uh, tactically it was. Uh, it was a very. It was a very sagacious uh, development because on the part of the court. Uh, you know, on the on the part on the part of the court and and uh, on the part of the the state to try to seek that relief. I think there was an understanding that uh, the court uh, could not readily fashion affirmative relief. In other words, telling school districts um, what to do and how to do it, or to compel certainly the legislature to appropriate funds. The, uh, the strongest weapon in the court's arsenal would be the so-called negative injunction. And that's what the administration asked, asked the court. So this was yeah. a victory for Governor Byrne, yes? I mean, when this, it, uh, when this decision came down, this vindicated his position on this issue, yes? I would say so, yes, very much so. And then how long after that did it take to get the legislature to enact an income tax? Uh, the the time frame, you know, eludes me, but I think I think the process started uh, pretty quickly and pretty directly following the, the the court's injunction and the decision to uh, ultimately to reopen the school. And then began the re-election year of so-called one-term burn, and yeah. he was way down in the polls uh, to uh, Ray Bateman, the Republican nominee. Yeah. Uh, what's your recollection of that year leading up to the re-election? I I was um, I was taken aback by the intensity 
of, uh, of the feelings, uh, of the, uh, of how vociferous, you know, the, the negative criticism, uh, criticism was, uh, my perception was that others had perceived that, uh, uh, Byrne had, uh, gone one step too far. He was, you know, over the top, you know, so, so to speak. And, uh, uh, I, I, I think there were those who felt that, well, if, if he took this stand and it was a heroic stand and, you know, let him fall on his, you know, on his own, on, on his own sword, we don't have to like him for it. And, um, and, uh, I think, uh, he, uh, I think he was, to my way, I think somewhat, you know, philosophical about it. Uh, I, I don't, I never had the sense that uh, 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 he was resentful in, in, in the sense that, you know, people didn't understand him and so on. I think he understood the stakes, that this was going to be very, very unpopular and, and a lot of this unpopularity was, was raining down on him. But he did it because? I think he did it because uh, uh, he, had no, he had no alternative. The policy was right. Uh, he felt the courts were right. Uh, he felt that this was clearly uh, in the public welfare and in the public interest. And, uh, and it was something that, yeah, as governor, he just had, he had to see through. Let's take a two, three minute break, um, and then let's talk about some other issues uh, and aspects of being counsel. Okay? Very good. Okay. Alan, uh, we all know today that Brendan Byrne has a second career, really, as the, the great after-dinner speaker in New Jersey and the funniest man in New Jersey public life. Um, it's been suggested that he really wasn't that funny back in the days when he was governor, that uh, this is some, some uh, appendage he's grown over, over the years. What, what can you tell us about whether uh, he was a funny man in those days? Um, I, I think that um, uh, he always uh, exhibited this um, I think extraordinarily uh, 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 droll streak and uh, uh, unusual way of uh, of looking at things, and his uh, the, his associations were uh, were were really amazing. But they were manifested for the most part in you know small personal you know personal exchanges. Um, uh, I, I hope he doesn't uh, take offense uh, at this observation. But when I when I joined his administration and had the opportunity to be with him on a more or less continuing basis, um, and in settings aside from office settings, but in uh, 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 larger meetings or. Uh, uh, situations where he'd be giving remarks or talks, um, I found his, uh, his deliveries painful. Uh, and, um, How I, so? Well, um, he, um, his, uh, his, his delivery, not, not his thought process, but his, his delivery uh, uh, appeared to be uh, disjointed uh, very uneven. Uh, the pauses uh, came unexpectedly. Uh, frequently, they were too long. Uh, he um, he didn't bother a great deal with uh, enunciation. He mumbled a little bit. Yes, that's what one could say. And I I can remember since. Uh, I now fancied myself becoming a uh, an astute politician uh, uh, that um, 
something ought to be done about it. And I, I remember talking to Senator Greenberg, you know, with the remarkable insight. You know, we ought to <laughs> have someone sit down with, uh, you know, with, with the governor and really concentrate on uh, on speaking and delivery. And did, so. did you mean getting him some professional speaking coaching? Uh, I, I wasn't th uh, that specific, but I really felt that there was not only room for improvement, but improvement was was imperative. Notwithstanding, uh, you know, that overall perception, and I wasn't a good judge of this sort of thing as to what is effective public speaking and when a, you know, a politician has a genuine need for it or when its absence is a, is, is a you know, is a real detriment. Uh, but but none of this uh, detracted from my uh, firm impression that he was uh, intellectually acute, uh, very, very quick, uh, with a strong sense of, uh, you know, the what was, you know, on point and material. And um, it's, uh, as, as well as my overall impression of uh, Brendan when he had been, you know, a lawyer and holding different offices and so forth, that he, he basically, uh, you know, could handle himself extremely well, you know, in the particular, you know, uh, context. That's why I had felt uh, that, uh, for example, uh, it, in, in the political sphere, if he were to engage in, in a debate, he would be well, well equipped to do that. Uh, although I continued to uh, think that his his delivery uh, <laughs> could could improve. So he was sharp. He just wasn't a good orator. Is that what you mean? I, I think that's a fair way to put it. Uh, what was his management style? Did he uh, get involved in a lot of the details of decision making? Did he was he uh, one of these delegators who uh, was hands off? Uh, how would you well, describe I'm, that? Uh, uh, not being a managerial type myself, or one uh, with uh, a strong administrative skills or background, uh, I I didn't have a good sense of how effective uh, Brendan was as a as a manager. He gave me the impression that um, he would um, be very content to delegate. Um, he had uh, a great deal of confidence in the people around him, and I think um, rightly I, so. I think yes, uh, and I I I, I think uh, it uh, it uh, revealed itself as a uh, as a style in which one would think that he was being casual. Uh, somewhat indifferent and so on, but I think uh, he was just being uh, economical, you know, in, in what he would uh, want done or what he might be referring to. Uh, he uh, would only use, uh, you know, one or two words rather than a half a dozen. And I think he had a binding sense that, that, that the people, um, he was asking to do something would do it, and he had, uh, I think, um, a good sense of what he was asking them to do, and what the problems or complications might be, and I, th I think his his follow up was always impressive. How so? Well, in terms of you know a day or two later, uh, what happened or. Uh, uh, did it go this way or that way? And so, he, how good was he at communicating what he wanted done? I th I think he um, I think he was very effective, and he was surrounded by people who really picked up on uh, what he wanted done, and uh, they didn't require you know enormous elaboration or detailed uh, instructions. Let me run through some of the other issue areas that uh, are often associated with Brendan Byrne and get you to give us your thoughts on them. Let me start with uh, casino gambling in Atlantic City. You refer to that in uh, 
your resignation letter. Uh, were you involved in that issue? How, how do you was, how do you see him in relation to that issue? Uh, at the time, the issue was uh, it was a dramatic issue, and it was and it was controversial. Uh, I think the uh, both uh, uh, arose because of the uh, inevitable uh, moral discourse that uh, organized gambling or state-sanctioned gambling, uh, you know, would would occasion. And um, there were there were many who uh, felt that uh, those implications uh, or drawbacks, as they saw them, uh, had to be given weight and really were perhaps more important than uh, seeing this as an activity uh, that would uh, become an important revenue source, uh, an economic uh, benefit uh, benefit to the state. Um, I never felt that Brendan had a serious problem with it in any personal sense. Uh, and I, this is just my total speculation. I, I never had a, a long talk with Brendan about it because I think the, the commitment was pretty much in place. Uh, but I, uh, Brendan, I think, uh, has always been a, um, a very open, tolerant person. And uh, I don't think, uh, while he might not personally approve of gambling and the like, I don't think he was, uh, you know, judgmental about people who, who gambled or wanted to gamble. Figured that was an aspect, a dimension of human nature, and you know, so be it. Um, so he didn't approach the problem as though he really had to uh, uh, square any real moral, moral complications. But he was very much concerned about some of the implications, the practical, real implications that uh, gambling might might engender. Uh, the most obvious uh, one, of course, would be um, uh, its attraction to, uh, you know, criminal activity and other unsavory activity and, and, and the like. And he felt that um, that could be uh, addressed and had to be addressed in terms of how uh, the gambling enterprise was uh, was was structured and, and, and supervised. So we set up a system much more strict than what they had in Las Vegas at the time. I think so, yes. Yeah. Uh, and I guess we've relaxed it somewhat over the years. Uh, some think it's overly restrictive. Do you have a view on that? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I think, um, I think it was, uh, I think it was needed. I mean, we set up the Casino Control Commission, but we also set up a division of gaming enforcement, enforcement yes. uh, that would bring cases before the Casino yeah, Control Commission. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we were real careful. Uh, I, I think uh, I think it was born of the fact that uh, no one could fully predict or fully analyze uh, the the extent of the threat of uh, you know of. Um, uh, of uh, you know criminality uh, creeping in creeping into gambling and I think in the, the governor's mind that was the foremost uh, vulnerability to the proposition for gambling um, and therefore he thought that at the at the very outset it was something that had to be addressed and, and, and could be addressed and was the reason for promoting it to get some more revenue into the state coffers or to salvage Atlantic City and uh, renovate Atlantic City? Uh, my, my own view was that uh, it was uh, the, the primary uh, uh, goal or objective was to, um, was to rehabilitate Atlantic City. 
I think that was more or less what was um, expressed as uh, uh, the reason for it. In other words, it, there, there would be other benefits to the state in terms of uh, increased tourism and uh, and and perhaps some some you know revenue realized by the by the state, but uh, the. Uh, uh, the dedication of uh, you know of funds to Atlantic City, I always felt was um, uh, was uh, was was paramount. As a matter of fact, I think that was included in the in the referendum uh, for the approval of casino gambling. Uh, interestingly enough, that question came before the New Jersey Supreme Court some years later. Uh, I think it, uh, it, it was in terms of whether the Redevelopment Authority, the Atlantic City Redevelopment Authority, could um, use its funds uh, elsewhere, and it had regularly used funds statewide, uh, the funds that it were realized from from casino gambling, and the. Uh, the Supreme Court held that that comported with the constitutional referendum. Uh, I disagreed with Justice Pollack. You thought the funding had to stay in Atlantic City? I, I thought it was part of the the, the question that uh, was authorized uh, by, by the vote to approve casino gambling. What else is part of the Byrne legacy, issue-wise? Uh, well, uh, you know, I subsume it uh, under the uh, uh, under the very broad heading of uh, you know basically uh, a good government and sound government. Uh, he uh, he very much uh, uh, brought his own uh, interest to bear in passing a model crim criminal code, uh, which resulted in. Uh, uh, a fundamental revision of our of our criminal laws uh, clearly needed uh, uh, revising and redefining basic uh, you know criminal <coughs> uh, criminal provisions uh, providing for uh, sentencing improvements uh, and and the like and I think he was um, he was very proud and uh, and just and and reasonably so for for the for that passage he also um i think um, um put his um, imprimatur behind the administrative procedure act uh, again that was a uh, signal improvement i think in 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 state government uh our state like all States has you know many administrative agencies, and uh, they handle uh, an extraordinary number of uh, issues and problems and cases that are you know are within their respective um, uh, areas of jurisdiction. It could be public utilities, environmental protection, uh, health services, labor. Uh, and so on. There's just an extraordinary gamut of, of public agency action. And historically and traditionally, these cases would be heard by the agency itself, by persons who were designated as hearing officers. And the hearing officers were agency employees. And the sense was that institutionally, uh, people who had matters before administrative agencies couldn't always get a an objective review or a fair shake because uh, the hearing officers were basically were you know uh, agency employees and might be reflecting agency approaches or points of view or biases and the like one of the things that the office of uh, that the administrative procedure act was to set up an independent office of administrative law with uh, independent authority to establish regulations uh, with uh, independent administrative law judges who have many of the qualifications and characteristics of superior court 
judges who are beholden only to the Office of Administrative Law, not to the administrative agencies, and that they will they hear contested cases, and those cases then ultimately go up to the head of the agency for final uh, for final decision before they could be appealed to the court. So it was a very signal improvement in in, in state government. Um, you didn't serve that long as counsel, did you? No, as it as it turned out, I expect. Tell us the story of uh, your appointment to the Supreme Court. Well, I was. <laughs> I was fully anticipating um, serving out uh, the governor's term and um, probably uh, uh, witnessing uh, his, uh, his denouement, uh, you know, at, at the end of the term and then hoping that uh, uh, the fates would uh, be able to put me back on the, uh, on the court. On the appellate? On, on the su superior on court. The uh, at, at the time, uh, the governor had uh, uh, designated uh, Steve Wiley as uh, the appointee to the Supreme Court. Uh, Wiley was a Democratic senator from Morris County? Yes, he was. And uh, uh, among the prominent names that I, I failed to mention before. But, uh, and, and I. I take it that uh, the vacancy on the court had been a vacancy that was created by uh, Justice Hall's retirement, and uh, that had been filled on a temporary basis by uh, Judge Comfort on the uh, on the uh, from the appellate division. And during the time I was with uh, uh, Brendan. Um, he uh, he was very committed to the Wiley appointment, and I think he was. Uh, not only did he admire Steve Wiley as uh, as a totally qualified uh, individual, a person of great ability and and integrity, um, but he was uh, very uh, grateful. Uh, to Senator Wiley because of his uh, leadership and support, uh, particularly in trying to uh, uh, usher in the, uh, the gross income tax. During the time I was there, though, um, there had been a challenge to Wiley's appointment, a constitutional challenge, and it resulted in a case called Vreeland versus Byrne. Suited. Vreeland was also a state senator. So this was a partisan challenge, was it? Well, it it, it was uh, it was brought by a Republican senator, and you know to that extent, uh, one might say it, w it was a partisan challenge. But it, it was a it was a challenge that um, uh, was a was a serious challenge, and it was predicated on the notion that a state senator would be ineligible for an appointment to an office, the salary or emoluments of which had been increased by the legislature during the term of that state senator. And it so happened that while uh, Senator Wiley was in the Senate during his term, judicial salaries had been increased. And it was perceived that this constitutional prohibition or stricture against an appointment of such a senator would apply to Senator Wiley. Um, the, uh, the legislature, anticipating that that challenge had some teeth to it, uh, then amended the salary, uh, judicial salary bill, and specifically exempted, uh, I don't know whether they exempted Senator Wiley by name, but they exempted any person who was appointed during the term to the Supreme Court from taking the salary increase. <laughs> so uh, the, their notion was that uh, as long as the appointee couldn't get the benefit of the increase in salary, that that would obviate the disqualification. 
And that was the case at the, that was before the Supreme Court. Uh, and the Supreme Court obviously struggled mightily over the issue because it, it took almost a, a year for them to um, hand down a decision. And I think the decision came down in the spring of 77, and the court was sharply divided. It voted 4-3, ruling that the Wiley appointment uh, uh, was not constitutional, that he was disqualified. In the meantime, um, uh, although there wasn't much to do while the case was pending, I, I had done everything I could to uh, so, to support and, and further um, Senator Wiley's appointment. I was, uh, had been an editor on the New Jersey Law Journal and, you know, it c contributed to editorial supporting it. And he was, as I said, he was a, a, a really estimable uh, a, a appointment. Uh, but when the opinion came down, uh, the governor uh, called me and asked me uh, whether I had read the opinion. I said, I'm in the middle of it. And he says, well, come on down to the office when you, when you finish it. And I read the opinion. As I said, it was a four to three decision. Uh, and uh, uh, the court said, uh, you know, quite starkly and quite plainly that uh, this amendment that exempted Wiley from the emolument didn't overcome the disqualification. It was a broader disqualification based upon emoluments occurring to the office uh, during the legislator's uh, term. Uh, I'm not sure of this, but I, I think Wiley may have even um, recused himself from voting. And uh, I think the court said that that didn't obviate the disqualification. It, it occurred during his term. So uh, the governor um, asked me, he said, well, is there anything we can do to uh, overcome this decision? And uh, nothing had occurred to me. I said, it, it doesn't raise a federal question. So there's no basis for going into federal court, for example, and advancing some kind of a federal ground or a federal constitutional uh, basis for trying to uh, uh, overcome the decision. I said, I don't think that uh, there's anything we can do in state court. Uh, the, the only possibility would be to ask the court to reconsider its decision, but I think it's, uh, I think it would be pointless and it would be viewed as being futile because the court took almost a year to decide this. It's resulted in a divided court with two very complete opinions, uh, you know, on the issue. I said the court has uh, considered this as intensely and as exhaustively as one one could expect. So I don't think anything is going to is going to come of that. And he um, he he agreed. I don't think I had to tell him this. Uh, and uh, I thought that was basically uh, uh, basically the end of it. And um, a short while later, I think the same day, he uh, called me back into his office and uh, broached the subject of uh, my joining the court. How did he broach it? Uh, he said, well, uh, the Wiley appointment, uh, you tell me, is um, not viable any anymore. Uh, would you consider being a member of the court? What'd you say? Uh, I said I uh, I'm taken aback, but I don't have to think about it. I said I uh, I said I would be uh, delighted and, and overwhelmed. You left his office, and in leaving his office, uh, you wrote a long letter to him. Uh, urging him to run for re-election and having read the letter today I, I, it now looks uh, quite prescient on your part you said don't run from the income tax campaign on the income tax uh, uh, stand up for what you've done and don't be afraid to debate your Republican opponent and so on and so on um, 
Do you recall that? And, and, and do I, you take pride in having predicted properly? Well, I, 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 I take a lot of satisfaction, uh, you know, in his in his reelection, uh, and uh, I, I don't ascribe any prescience uh, to myself. I, I just I just felt that uh, 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 Brendan uh, I had always believed was a was a person of of enormous integrity and. Um, uh, and that impression was reinforced, you know, when I when I when I served with him. And I I just had a sense that uh, as difficult as that quality is to identify and define, that uh, uh, that that people who would be exposed to someone like Brendan would would have a sense of that aspect of his of his character, which I think is uh, uh, in in a way I think it's it's not, not only distinctive, it's unique because he, he had been um, he had been tested, you know, so many times in the course of his uh, in the course of his term and his in his in his consistency and his commitment. What I would call his integrity, I think, had been um, uh, constantly uh, uh, tested and constantly, uh, constantly revealed, and I, I thought, really, that that was his only shot, <laughs> so to speak. Um, Show yourself. That he's 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 not going to come across as a as a charismatic person. He's he's not going to come. Uh, Come across as uh, uh, someone with any kind of uh, flamboyance. Uh, uh, he, he he will only come across as someone who is uh, you know singular in his commitment to what he thought would be right and good, and uh, that in the course of a campaign that that could come across that uh, that the people ultimately will would have a sense. That they are dealing with a with a person who is, I would say, had, was the real goods. Did you want to take a break? Yeah. Tell me when. I didn't. Um, I didn't mention who won squash games, Governor. So you accepted this appointment, uh, apparently, according to your letter, with tremendous. A tremendous sense of fulfillment, uh, like you had arrived at the place you always wanted to get. Is that true? Well, I uh, I, I never had any, you know, crystallized idea that uh, uh, my career would eventuate on the Supreme Court. Um, I always uh, I always felt that uh, there's there's no way one can appropriately or properly seek an office like that, uh, that uh, it was a matter of enormous coincidence and luck when it happens to people. Uh, and it was never a, uh, an active uh, idea or thought as far as, as far as I was concerned. I was very uh, fulfilled in, in being a judge. and. Um, and fully hope to you know go back to the uh, go back to the judiciary. How did it compare with the year as counsel? How does it compare? What's the difference? Uh, well, it was it was an, uh, for me it was an enormous uh, challenge. Uh, it, it left me uh, against uh, with you know a sense of. Uh, uh, overwhelmed by by the responsibility you know of, of the work of the work on the court and uh, uh, just really set about it uh, in terms of uh, trying to, uh, paying attention to detail preparing myself as 
as thoroughly and as carefully as I could. It's an even more burdensome responsibility than being chief counsel to the governor. Am I right? Uh, th there, there, there is a sense that uh, that uh, that your your actions, your decisions, uh, are going to have an impact. That they're going to affect people. That they that they will resonate. Uh, as as counsel to the governor, uh, you're a lawyer. You're trying to help uh, your governor uh, uh, resolve problems, uh, uh, take, uh, you know, a sound and good and correct course of action, and you're part of a process. Um, and to that extent, your own responsibility is not, uh, you know, always readily perceived, doesn't stand out, uh, and so it's 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 quite different from uh, uh, being on the court and rendering decisions that affect the 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 interests of of parties and and others. What doesn't the public understand about the de decision making process of the court? What should people know about how the court goes about making its decisions? Uh, it's it's a very hard question, and I think it's a it's a question that really addresses a a real interest and 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 concern, and it's one that has been asked uh, uh, it forever, really, in terms of uh, uh, the public's relationship to the courts and the courts' uh, relationship to the public. And I think our system reflects a, um, a tension which is born of uh, trying to deal with uh, factors that can't easily be uh, reconciled or integrated uh, in our system. And I think our system is a paradigm. Uh, uh, judicial um, independence is an uh, extraordinarily important feature of you know of our judicial branch, and uh, for judges to to be independent to a great extent, they must be divorced from um, public uh, pressure and public sentiment, uh, and and the like. At the same time, they have to be you know fully aware of the public interest, and the question is how do courts become aware and responsive? you know, to the public interest. Well, it's only through the vehicle of cases that come before the court, and, and, and our judicial system has, uh, has structures whereby the court becomes informed as to what is at issue, what the legal standards are, how they should be applied, to what extent the public interest uh, factors into those things. So I think within the judicial structure, uh, the court uh, has to very conscientiously uh, use its own structures and its own traditions to be certain that uh, it is performing its function uh, uh, in in the public interest. My my own feeling is that uh, to the extent possible, uh, courts uh, should be responsive to that, and courts should be accountable. And uh, to that end, uh, I think one of the things uh, a judge or justice can do is uh, basically explain uh, his position. Uh, this leads to, um, in my case, the very long opinions. And I, my uh, uh, former employer, the uh, Governor Byrne, would sometimes complain as to, why can't the opinions be short? <laughs> And uh, that's a very legitimate uh, complaint and a very legitimate point of view. I served with uh, Justice Sullivan, and his his idea was that when when you write an opinion, just say it. You know, explain what the case is about, explain the issue, explain what standards you you're you're using and how you're applying the standards and and the result. And that's all you have to do. And you can't quarrel with that 
to to a great extent. But my own my own feeling is that uh, you know issues are often very controversial, very nuanced, uh, and that even even if a court you know may uh, uh, be challenged, there's a duty to really expose your reasoning, you know, for good or for ill. So that uh, again, those who are affected and impacted by the opinion can say, "Well, I I disagree with that reasoning. I think it's I think it's a wrong result, and try to do what you can to uh, to alter it or to modify it if it's possible." You spoke of judicial independence. Um, when you joined the court, you joined two other ex counsels to Governor Byrne on the High Court. And you were soon joined by Tom Kane's policy director, and there are four of you up there out of seven, uh, all beholden to the executive branch. Uh, three of you to Governor Byrne, one of you to Governor Kane. How independent can you really be? Well, um, two other counsel joined me. I didn't join them. Um, Forgive me for getting my time sequence <laughs> wrong. No, not at all. Uh, uh, this is a, it raises an interesting and, and difficult issue because everybody comes to the court with, with a background uh, and that background uh, plays out really in, in how that member of the court uh, discharges you know, his or her own responsibilities. Um, the, the, the institutional wisdom or understanding is that a conflict that is simply born of experience uh, but that doesn't engender uh, anything uh, more direct or more personal is the type of conflict that the judge should be able to overcome and to neutralize and, and to deal with uh, uh, so that the judge basically assimilates uh, his or her experience, uses it, and sometimes it will, uh, it will be reflected in, in, in decisions that appear to be consistent with what the judge has done before sometimes. It, it does not. So it, 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 it calls for a certain amount of intellectual honesty uh, and fortitude on the part of the judge uh, uh, in in dealing with that. I uh, uh, one of the early cases that I had was a case called Camden County versus Byrne, and for some reason I have a an impression of the governor arguing a case, and it might have been that case, but I may, maybe not. The governor came and argued a case before the Supreme Court. I th I. Th I think so, but at at any rate, the case involved a uh, difficult budgetary question, and it may have been the line item veto. And uh, I didn't feel that there was anything in my experience as governor's counsel that would serve to disqualify me from determining the the issues, including the constitutionality, you know, of that of that problem. I felt my experience helped me understand uh, the issues, but it didn't leave me with any preconceived notion or any even subliminal feeling that somehow or other, uh, uh, you know, the governor ought to be ought to be vindicated if at all possible. So we have a kind of honor system uh, with the justices where uh, we accept your own understanding. Of whether you have a conflict or not, almost it it, it makes me think of uh, the instance at the national level of Justice Scalia going hunting with uh, Vice President Cheney and then ruling on the energy case in which Cheney was involved. We relied on Scalia uh, to decide that he didn't need to recuse himself on that matter, and uh, I guess by implication, uh, can we really rely on? Four former members of, an administ of of administrations to take a truly impartial view in a case that pits the executive branch against 
some other entity? I, uh, I, I, I think uh, we can be confident. And Alan, we were in the middle of uh, something about judging, but yeah. uh, as we were changing tapes, uh, you had a thought about uh, looking back on the administration and, and a couple of things the governor did. You want to share those? Uh, well, I, uh, I was always impressed uh, by uh, uh, his, his range of uh, thinking and reactions. He, he could go from the lofty to the mundane with, uh, with um, a little, little difficulty. And uh, I'm not certain whether this occurred while I was there or at some time thereafter, but for example, uh, during the gasoline crisis of that of that period, uh, and there were just uh, horrendous lines of traffic of people queuing up for uh, to get gasoline, and um, it was an, an enormous uh, uh, enormous problem. And the governor uh, issued an executive order saying that there would be odd days and even days, referring to uh, the numbers on the license plate. Any any solve the problem. I mean, the lines were cut in half, and, um, and uh, it, it no longer was an issue. And then again, I think sometime later, um, I think he was the first or one of the first to uh, authorize a right turn on red. Uh, I think both of these things ultimately became national uh, uh, patterns, but... Uh, what does it say about him? Uh, well, it, it, it's, it says a lot about uh, his 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 range of mind and interests and his uh, and his ability to uh, I think pay attention to everything that's that's going on. We were talking about your uh, tenure on the court, and we could talk about that for a very long time. Uh, let me uh, just pick the thing I think you're most remembered for on the court and ask you to talk about it, and that is your opposition to the death penalty. Were you the lone dissenter uh, on the Supreme Court in upholding the reinstatement of the death penalty in New Jersey? Uh, yes, uh, you know, since that time there have been others who have dissented, uh, but uh, during, during my tenure on the court, I was I was the only uh, only dissenter, although there were some cases in which there were dissents and others others joined the dissents. Uh, but in terms of uh, dissents based on the fundamental unconstitutionality of the death penalty, uh, I didn't have much company. The legislature and uh, the executive at the time, I guess it was Kane, uh, enacted the death penalty in 1982, I believe. I think it was about then, yes. Um, why do you think it's unconstitutional? Which constitution does it violate? Well, it, I, I think uh, I could only say uh, from my standpoint that it's violative of the, um, of the state constitution. And uh, it's, it's difficult to uh, summarize or state, you know, quickly or, or easily uh, uh, the grounds upon which I, I very strongly feel that uh, the death penalty is unconstitutional. There's not a phrase like cruel and unusual that you well, could point to? Well, uh, I, I would, uh, this construct, um, I think, um, has um, helped clarify my own thinking. Uh, for a number of reasons, I think that in resurrecting the death penalty and uh, assuming that there are viable, realistic, practical procedures by which a capital case can be fairly and sensibly prosecuted. I think the state basically has set an impossible goal I think it's just simply not possible to try a death penalty case and accommodate the several different 
constitutional interests that are implicated in a death penalty prosecution. If you look at due process, uh, you can debate endlessly the kind of what kind of process is due in a particular case. And in case after case, you will find anomalies in, in the procedures that have been used. And I think the courts uh, basically uh, temporizing in terms of whether that due process was adequate. For example, we have said in criminal cases that what a lawyer tells a jury in summation is not evidence. You shouldn't consider it as evidence. You get your instructions from the court, and the court will comment on the evidence if it sees fit. In capital cases, uh, we've had lawyers, for example, tell jurors, well, if this defendant is sentenced to life, he won't see the light of day. The judge doesn't say a word about that. Later on, the case is appealed, and the defendant is saying, well, the jury was never instructed carefully and adequately as to what an alternative penalty might be. And the court would say, well, they heard it from the lawyer. They wouldn't do that in a run-of-the-mill criminal case, yet in a, in a capital case, the, law, the court has done it. So I think the bar is, is high, and it's, you know, you might say it's too high, but it's got, it's got to be high. So I don't think these cases, and, and you can find it in so many different areas, effective assistance of counsel, jury voir dire, uh, we've now said that uh, grand juries have to be presented with capital, be death qualified and so forth. And when uh, you come to the end of these, these cases, th there's, there's no way you can find that it has been tried with the level of procedural uh, strictness and fairness that, that a death penalty case uh, requires. The upshot of it is that uh, if a defendant is convicted and sentenced to die as a, as a result of a case like that, that becomes automatically, I would say, a cruel and unusual punishment. And we also uh, are insistent here that the death penalty should be meted out with a sufficient degree of uniformity and consistency, and yet we find that it is impossible to reconcile death penalties within the state from county to county and from the profile of different defendants and the like. So I just, I just think that regardless of one's moral or perhaps religious feelings about the state being able to exact the death penalty as an ultimate punishment, in our ju uh, system of, of jurisprudence, uh, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's possible. Which is perhaps why we haven't executed anybody in 25 years. Uh, finally, let's uh, ask a little bit about your life. Where were you born? What did your parents? Who were your parents? I uh, I was born in Newark, raised in Newark. Uh, uh, my father was a uh, a long time Newark practitioner, a lawyer. Uh, and uh, I, uh, when I came out of law school, I started practicing in Newark and practiced in Newark for, for a few years. And then where'd you go to college and where'd you go to law school? I, I went to Princeton and then went to Harvard. Harvard Law School? Harvard Law School. Uh, Brendan was uh, several years ahead of me. And uh, uh, I remember at one of our Harvard Law School Association dinners, we had one of our professors down, Professor Kasner, and um, he took great pains to tell us all how, what, a, what a commendable student <laughs> Governor Byrne was. Uh, I practiced in Newark for, for several years, and then... Uh, Not with your father. With, with my oh, father. with your father. With my father. What was the name of the firm? Charles Handler. <laughs> and it was a, it was a general practice. I, I got a, a wonderful exposure to uh, just a cross-section of, uh, of law. And uh, uh, thereafter, I joined the Attorney General's office. Uh, 
first assistant? Uh, I, I was, uh, I became first assistant after several years and remained in the Attorney General's office for about six or seven years. And then what governor put you on the bench first time? Governor Hughes. And I think the rest, uh, I think the rest we have filled in along the way. I hope so. <laughs>